To speak on behalf of Oakland and Transparency today, we have Jen Palka. Jen is the founder and executive director of Code for America. She's the former CTO of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policies, where she founded the United States Digital Service. Uh, she's the winner of many, many prestigious awards. <laughs> she's a graduate of Yale University and <clears throat> the best part, she lives in Oakland with the husband and daughter. So without further ado, please welcome up on stage our speaker for today, Jen Palka. Thanks, Savio. Yeah, I'm a morning person. I feel like I've found my tribe. Like, <laughs> great energy in the morning. Um, and, I, and, I, and I've heard of um, Creative Mornings for a long time. I didn't realize there was one here. So I'm so excited. I'm really grateful to be asked to be here. Um, and I know that what I am really is an excuse for a great community that gets together and shares and around ideas. So we'll talk about a couple of ideas. Um, but um, thanks for welcoming me into the community. So transparency as a theme is very interesting for me. I was sort of intrigued um, by the opportunity to talk about this because I feel like it's um, uh, a very much a journey for me and my organization in terms of our relationship to the idea of transparency. Um, the organization that I run is called Code for America and it was actually born at a place called Transparency Camp. This was July 2009 and I had gotten very interested in the sort of nascent open government movement at the time uh, the uh, new administration in DC had made publishing of, op of government data a big priority. Um, states and uh, cities were starting to do it. Uh, and a community was starting to grow around the notion that all of this open data and transparency could, could really be uh, transformative to our democracy. And this was an idea that was really, really exciting to me. So I was working on an event called Gov2.0 that was that uh, had come out of an event called Web 2.0, so this was back when Web 2.0 was still a big thing. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I got excited about this idea of bringing folks from the tech industry into government to accelerate the pace of this open government, open data, and transparency. So I went to this event at Google that the Sunlight Foundation hosted, and I sat at a table, and I told somebody my idea, and I heard from across the table from a guy who worked at Sunlight Foundation, hey, we'll fund that. <laughs> uh, and then somebody else from the other side of the table said, I work in city government, we'd love to partner with you on that. Um, and that was, that was the day that I realized I could really do this. I could start this organization, we could, uh, we could partner with local governments, we could bring people in from the tech industry, and we could help governments take a more iterative and user-centered and data-driven approach uh, to uh, their digital services and to getting their data out there. It's so in our roots, it's so core to our, uh, like our DNA. We were born from this transparency movement, the Sunlight Foundation and Transparency Camp, and yet fast forward to 2016, and I would say I think that I have found sort of the ways in which transparency is beautiful and wonderful and the ways that sometimes transparency is not the right thing if we're focused on the needs of users in our community. Uh, our, our mission statement at Code for America is that we want government to work better for the people and by the people in the 21st century. And I'd like to talk a little bit this morning about how, how I've come from thinking of transparency as the thing to transparency as a thing in service of better government. We had our first year in 2011 uh, where we had folks uh, come in and partner with cities and do amazing projects. I'm actually gonna tell you about one of the projects from the second year. Uh, and in fact, it involves one of the founders of Open Oakland uh, that Neil just talked about, Eddie Tejeda, who I guess isn't here this morning, but he's off and around. Eddie is uh, a guy from the tech industry. He had his own company. He was building great digital projects and he, took the leap 
uh, faith and decided to come to us for a year and do a year of service. And we put them in a small team with several others and we sent them off to New Orleans. In New Orleans, they had a really big problem. Um, uh, you, you won't be surprised to hear that it had to do with blighted properties, but it wasn't just that there are a lot of blighted properties after Hurricane Katrina. Um, and in fact, there were a lot of blighted properties before Hurricane Katrina. It's that the city was going around and making decisions about those blighted properties without understanding of what was going on in the neighborhoods. So they'd go de demolish you know, this, this property on a block when the people in the neighborhood knew that in fact so-and-so's brother was gonna come uh, uh, um, refurbish that house. And it was the other house on the block that we really needed to take care of. But the problem is that even the city didn't know at any given time what was going on, because the data about whether a property had been reported for blight, whether it had been inspected, whether they had had a hearing about it, whether there was a judgment, there were all these steps in the process, was held on different inspectors' computers, different databases, all around the, wor uh, the workforce of the city. And so there was only one time a month when the uh, city could tell you what was going on with a blighted property, and that was at the monthly blight status meetings when all of the data owners were in the room at the same time. And what that meant was that there was this constant tension between the people in the neighborhoods who were advocating for the proper use of the city's resources to both demolish or refurbish homes, um, and the people in the government who sort of just didn't know what was going on. So these blight status meetings, which were open to the public, were notoriously contentious. Uh, they were basically people in the neighborhoods advocating for their needs, yelling at people in government who were sort of defensive. So the CIO of the city had gone to their sort of normal um, vendor community and said, you know, could we find a way that this data could be put together and we could see the status of blighted properties? And um, what the CIO told us was that um, one of the vendors had said, yes, it'll take about three years, it'll cost several million dollars to do. Um, but Eddie and his friends went down there. They really, I think the most magical work that they did is just charming all the people who owned the data into letting them have access to it. Um, at Code for America, we have all sorts of different tactics for that. Most of them involve baked goods. Um, <laughs> but they got access to the data and uh, they um, basically made a beautiful web front end in which you could type in the address of any property in New Orleans and it would show you whether it had been inspected, whether it had been reported, whether there was a hearing, all these things. Just really beautifully done in a way that looks like a consumer web app, not a government website. And they took it to um, the Blight Status Meeting and I got a call, I wasn't there, I got a call from the woman, Denise Ross, who was sponsoring us there and she said, you don't know what just happened. We just had a productive conversation with our citizens. We stopped fighting and we started talking about what to do about the blighted properties in the neighborhood because we were all on the same page. We all had the same data. And it was, a fun, it was the first time I really understood, mm, maybe a couple times before, but it was a really profound time when I realized it's not about government efficiency, though it is, of course, but it's not fundamentally about that. And it's not fundamentally about the value of openness, it's about the relationship between citizens and their government and being able to have a productive, trusting relationship instead of fighting all the time. So we've done hundreds of projects, but the other one I really want to talk about in terms of the true value of transparency, um, or actually a set of them, um, ha are, are based here in Oakland. Um, so Neil mentioned um, the Open Budget uh, Project, o Open Budget Oakland. Um, open disclosure. Um, there's been another, uh, several other projects um, like Soft Story, um, which maps um, the properties in Oakland that are likely to fall down in an earthquake. So they're taking data and making it available and engaging the citizens. And this all happens through Open Oakland Tuesday nights uh, on a volunteer basis. Please, please go get involved. I'll, and you will hear me say that another couple of times tonight, today, this morning. But we also did a fellowship project in Oakland in 2013. So there's just the difference there is that we've got people who've taken a year off and dedicated themselves full time to this. So go back to 2012, 2011. Um, what was the thing that was really, um, I, I guess this is a terrible pun, but occupying the minds of Oaklanders? It was Occupy Oakland. And there was an enormous breach of faith and trust between the citizens, and particularly journalists, and City Hall 
around getting information about what had actually happened during that time. Um, there were, the city had been flooded with requests for information, access to the mayor's emails, access to the chief of police's emails. What, what was going on there? And the city was not fulfilling all of those open records requests. So as you guys probably know, you have the right to request records from your city government. But what often happens and what was happening in Oakland at that time was that a whole bunch of people were saying, yeah, I want to know what happened. You have, to, you have to open this record up and show us. And the city was completely flooded with these requests. This is a really, really common thing for me where I'm hearing frustration and anger from citizens that turns into a, they don't, uh, an assumption that they don't want to share that. They're, not, they don't, they're trying to keep those emails closed. And I know that that's sometimes that is the case in relationships with um, government, but I would say in my experience, so often it's not that they don't want to, it's that there's no system for tracking it, no one knows which things have come in, no one knows which um, records requests have been fulfilled, there's no central coordinating place, and there's an incredible ability, and we saw this there too, for um, both sides to say that the reason that record, open record request wasn't filled was the other guy's fault. So you know, you'd hear from the, from the city, like, I know I got that, but I thought someone else had filled it. And by the way, the records request was way too broad, so I wrote back to the guy and I said, well, you need to tell me which emails, and they never got back. But that guy is now saying oh, publicly that we're not fulfilling his request. And so it took a low trust situation and pushed it even lower because the city didn't have the tools that they needed to, to monitor and, and accurately fulfill all of these open records requests. There's a whole bunch of other issues that were going on there about just the, the low capability on tech of our city government where even things like getting into the email system was just tough for people. And that's another thing that um, the Open Oakland folks work with city government on is just like, do you have the tools you need to do your job? So in this environment, uh, uh, Oakland, City of Oakland asked us to come in and uh, have some fellows join us uh, in the same sort of manner that Eddie Tejeda did in, um, in New Orleans. So we had three fellows on this project. And what they built seems pretty simple. How many of you folks here are, uh, you know, do websites? Yeah. So it would be probably the solution that you would come up with, except they spent an enormous amount of time with the folks in government understanding the real needs, what worked and what didn't work for them. But they built a website called um, Rec Record Track, and you can go to it right now. It's records.oaklandnet.com. Uh, it's a slightly odd um, URL. Um, they're going to fix the URL for the city, city website soon. But basically, all records requests are, are done publicly. So if you want the emails from uh, the current, uh, you know, police chief, well, I guess we don't have a police chief right now, but <laughs> if we had one, you have to go on and fill out your form in a way that everyone can see. So your request itself is transparent to the rest of the community, and their responses to you, if you, they need to clarify what you're asking for, are also completely transparent. And so this is all done in the, in the, in the open, and furthermore, when you go on the site, you'll, the first thing you'll see is, has somebody already requested the records you're asking for? Why are we fulfilling these things over and over again? So if you want those, maybe someone else already did them, they've already been fulfilled and they're already up on the site. No, then the city staff doesn't have to do a records request again. And I think this is another example of where just that putting everybody on the same page and making sure all your communications with your city government are open fixed a trust problem. It's not that the city suddenly has all the resources that it needs. It's not that they can fulfill all the requests in a super timely manner anymore, uh, you know, all of a sudden. Um, it's not that people aren't asking for things that, that demonstrate you know, a real skepticism of government and that, you know, that, that can be tough on the city employees. It's just that it's all out there and that nobody can call foul on the, on the other and that we're actually making it a little bit more efficient. And it was wonderful, I think, for me as an Oaklander um, who started this project thinking, oh my God, Oakland will never be able to work with us, to see something that really felt like um, sort of a, a, a collective um, a pain, that, that low trust after um, Occupy Oakland, have a little bit of a better outcome. It felt like a little bit of a healing of our community and our ability to communicate um, between citizens and the government. And by the way, there's now about 18,000 requests have gone through that portal rec oh, um, record. Oh, hello! <laughs> I'm totally in love with this dog. Um, 
So those are two um, great examples, I think, of the, of the value of transparency uh, that were for, for us for 2012 and 2013. Um, I really do love the dog. Um, and then we started also in 2013 to work um, in an area that has sort of the same set of needs for digital folks to help out with government, um, but a little bit that sort of started, started us on a different road, and that was working in food stamps. This was in San Francisco, right across the bay. They had a team come in. They wanted us to help because they knew that a ton of people sign up for food stamps every year. It's our, our state's nutrition assistance program is called CalFresh. And it's a little money, ex, a little extra money every month for food that you get on an EBT card. Um, so a lot of people sign up for it. It's actually really hard to sign up for, which I'll get to. But once you're signed up, um, very often, most people end up falling off the program and again in six months. Not because they, in some cases, because they no longer need it or no longer qualify, but very often but because this, the city or the county has asked for additional documentation of your status and you haven't provided it. And so this team went in there and sort of, I mean, they, they did what we do in every case, which is they try to become a user. They signed up for the program and they started getting these notifications in the mail and they found that it was pretty obvious why people don't stay on the program. You get, first of all, you get notices in the mail. So if you don't have consistent access to a mailing address, you're already behind the game. But these notifications were written in crazy legal ease, pages and pages of language that I frankly did not understand at all, that hidden in there somewhere was a sort of badly worded request for you to send in more, uh, say, a pay stub or more evidence of your, uh, your income. And when you get a letter like that and ignore it, which I absolutely would have, um, you will then find that you go to the store and try to use your EBT, try to get food for you or your family and find that your card doesn't work because you've been dropped off the rolls, but you didn't know that. And most of the people would find out literally at the front of the line of the grocery store um, and very, very often uh, at midnight on a Wednesday because that's when they refill the cards. Uh, that's not a good time to find out that you're not getting food for your family. It typically means that you have gone a couple days without food. Um, and these are administrative reasons that people are not able to provide food for their family. So that team decided to, uh, they, they finished their, um, their uh, project with the city, of San, city and county of San Francisco at the end of 2013. They had helped fix this problem um, by starting to collect cell phone uh, numbers and text messaging people when they were about to fall off the rolls and having them call in and fix the problem using plain language that people could understand. But that team said um, they didn't want to stop their work. Um, I was away in uh, DC that year and so I actually didn't realize that these folks um, just decided to stick around. It's a one year fellowship, but a year and a half later I came back and there they were saying, um, we can't stop working on this problem because we've seen too much bad that happens to people in need because of these administrative failures. And what they did is they backed up in the system and they said, okay, it's not just about what people falling off, it's that California has the second lowest rate of adoption of food stamps by eligible people in the country. The only other state with lower adoption rates is Wyoming. There's somewhere between two and three million people in our state who could be getting food assistance, are eligible for it, which means, frankly, they probably need it, and they probably need it for their kids. One in four kids in the country takes advantage of food stamps uh, in the rest of the country. Uh, but there's so many people in California who are eligible for this program that aren't on it. And um, it will not shock you why I'm going to show this slide. So this is, if you want to apply for food stamps, you can go into an office or you can do it online, but this is how about half of the California counties, including uh, uh, San Francisco and Oakland, so this is how you'd apply online for food stamps. It's a 52 screen application with a couple hundred questions. And the questions are things like, there's a whole page of questions that are variants on, have you or any member of your family ever traded food stamps for guns, ammunition, or drugs since April 15, 1990, or something like that? I mean, the questions are bad. A lot of them are confusing. You don't know how to answer them. And some of them are, frankly, just downright insulting. And I'm not sure that they're necessary. Um, so the team said, we think that we can help fix um, the food stamps gap um, if we just make a better way for people to apply. 
uh, so they, there's a very simple online form that you can use now that our team built. Um, you can demo it if you're not eligible for food stamps at demo.getcalfresh.org. You can do it on a mobile phone. So the, the previous application that you saw, you may not be surprised to hear that it does not work at all on a mobile phone. And many people with low income only have a mobile phone as their access to the internet. So we made a beautiful, easy way that works for people to apply for food stamps. We, of course, then just apply them through, you know, for them through the, through the, the website. Um, and we said, great, we should fix the problem, yay. But let's just follow up and find out. Let's just check. So we started text messaging all of our clients to find out what happens next. So one of the next things after you apply is you have to um, take a phone call and do a phone interview, or you can go in. You have to provide documentation, several other steps that you go through before you actually get the benefit. So we started texting people and said, you know, what happened? Did you get the benefit? What happened? And we found that, in fact, of the people who gone through our site, most of them were not ending up getting access to CalFresh. And we started documenting the barriers that, that they were encountering. And I'll give you one example, and this is going to slightly um, undermine my, my next point, which is that we don't share a lot of this data publicly. But um, in one county, um, about 25% of the people told us that they were getting the letter telling them when their interview was after the date of the interview. We had another county where everyone was saying, well, I got this form, this fraud protection and prevention form in the mail. I, I can't answer these questions. I feel very intimidated. I don't, I, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to go to jail if I answer these questions. I don't understand them. So I haven't sent it back in. And their process for applying just stops there. So we sent that letter to the county welfare director and said, you know, this is not required by any law, policy, or regulation. And she said, oh, we don't send that letter out. And two weeks later, she called us back and said, thanks for telling me. I didn't know the social workers were doing that. I've stopped them. They're not sending that letter out anymore. It's no longer a barrier to, achieve, to getting food stamps. And what we see then in the data that we collect with the people that we're text messaging back and forth with is in that county, more people actually get through the process and the enrollment rates start to go up. And so this is an opportunity that was sort of a fork in the road for us. We had a choice at this point, once we'd collected some of this data, that we could hold that value of transparency and open data in which we were, you know, our organization was born and tell all the world about what these county welfare offices were doing wrong. And I did obviously just tell you two examples of that. But we've chosen largely not to share that data, except as examples of what it is we're trying to do in service of people who need food assistance. We've chosen to keep that data private, except with the county welfare directors. And the reason is that when you publish that data, you provoke in the institution of government, wherever it is, a, a public relations response. And it becomes about the story not about getting someone food. And when we tell people privately, here's something you're doing wrong, and we can help you fix it, and we find that they do fix it because they also want those people to get access to food benefits, that's a lot faster and a lot better way of getting the outcome we actually seek, even though it feels sometimes, sometimes like we've sort of sacrificed or maybe compromised one of our principles of openness and transparency. So we've been on this journey of um, a more sophisticated and complicated relationship with transparency um, for quite some time. And I remember, um, has anyone here seen the movie Lincoln? You know, I walked to that movie and I was like, this is, this is an anti-transparency movie. This is a Spielberg story about how in order to get some, to something that mattered deeply to the core values that I think we all hold to the, to the history of our country, there had to be backroom deals. Uh, and now I'm an enormous fan of Hamilton, the musical. My daughter knows all of the words to the first, um, the first act and is memorizing the entire second act. She thinks I'm pathetic because I only know a few words to some of the songs. But has anyone heard the song, The Room Where It Happens? No one else was in the room where it happens. It's a song about Alexander Hamilton trading in a backroom deal the location of our nation's capital in order to get his financial plan through Congress. He did a backroom deal um, <clears throat> uh, with Madison and Jefferson um, that you know, really pissed a lot of people off. Um, and the song is by Aaron Burr, 
complaining about this and saying, you know, um, we don't have a say in what they trade away when these things happen. And if you, if you, if you hear it out of context, it sounds like you know, an indictment of backroom deals and, and a call for transparency. But if you, if you hear it in the context of the musical, it's somebody getting upset about not being included, but that backroom deal had to happen for us to have a strong financial system, for us to um, not let the southern states um, off the hook for being part of our country. And it is one of those trade-offs that we make. And uh, it's, it's come to mean a lot to me, um, and I, I wouldn't call any of the work that we're doing with county welfare directors backroom deals by any means, um, but it's come to mean a lot to me as I've gone from thinking, this is a core value that I hold that I won't compromise to, this is something um, that is a value I hold in tension with other values. And one of those other values is experimentation. Um, we have to let government and let ourselves have private spaces where we mess up and we're not held accountable because we can fix it better if it's on us to fix it. And that's really where I've come to is, I think all of our values get challenged in some way when they're held in tension with another value that means also something important to the goal that you're trying to achieve. Our goal at the end of the day, we realized, was government that works better for the people and by the people. And transparency was a means to those ends when it's the right thing. Um, but we also have to uh, balance it with the ways in which we let people do things privately uh, and put those together in such a way that we end up with just better government that works better for the people, costs less, and does more for our people. So, um, I think all of us struggle with that um, in, the, in the, uh, the better government movement. What I would say, though, is one value that I hold that I think is, is uh, sort of not challenged is the value of participation by all. And I will end by saying that if this strikes a chord with you and your ability to change government, make it better, not just by holding it accountable publicly, but by helping out, being the carrot, not just the stick, then please, um, uh, we are always uh, hiring at Code for America, but more importantly, right here in Oakland, you have Open Oakland who's doing this work, so please, please, please get involved. And thank you so much for having me.